rentrer. Bon, ouais, on va attendre les gens finissent de rentrer. <rire> ah, voilà. Oh là. Bien, bonjour. Nous allons recommencer là notre session de l'après-midi. Euh, D'abord par une table ronde qui est euh, co-organisée par euh, l'Alliance France GBC, euh, Fran oui France GBC, l'Alliance HQE France GBC et euh, bah, le Master euh, Immobilier et Construction Durable de, euh, de l'École des Ponts Paris Tech. Et nous allons inviter à cette euh, table ronde euh, trois personnes qui sont Christina Gamboa, qui est la, la présidente du World Green Building Council. Nous allons inviter également Marjolaine Meignier-Milfer en tant que présidente de l'alliance HQE France GBC. Et euh, également la troisième personne, Régis Meyer, euh, de la direction des affaires internationales du ministère de la transition écologique et aussi représentant français de la globale euh, ABC. Je, je répète à nouveau que nous devons excuser Magali Regeza, euh, qui n'a pas pu nous rejoindre. Voilà, je demande aux participants de euh, rejoindre la scène. So, uh, good afternoon everybody, we start again our uh, session. And uh, we start during one hour, uh, a round table, uh, which has been organized by the Alliance HQE France GBC, and uh, the Executive Master uh, Sustainable Building and Real Estate de l'École des Ponts Paris Tech. Uh, thank you for joining us. So uh, I will introduce, introduce you very, very briefly. Uh, and then uh, we will start the, uh, the discussions uh, and some presentation during the roundtable. And after half an hour, I think, Uh, we will be able to, to answer your questions. So uh, I have the pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Christina Gamboa. And uh, I introduce you very, very briefly. So Christina, you are the Chief Executive Officer of the World Green Building Council. And for those who do not know uh, what the Green Building Council is, maybe, uh, it's a global action network Uh, comprising more than 70 green building council, is this? Yes, more than 70. Uh, catalyzing the uptake of sustainable bit environment for everyone and everywhere. You will tell us more about your association. Um, Marjolaine, uh, Marjolaine Mini Milfer, uh, you are the, uh, the president of HQE, Alliance HQE France GBC. And uh, you are also, since uh, 2017, uh, you are a member of the French Parliament. You are currently the Rapporteur for the Information Mission on Energy Renovation of Buildings. And uh, also, since November 2020, uh, you were appointed as a permanent member of the National Council for Ecological Transition. Finally, Regis, Regis Meyer, you are an expert for the decarbonization of the building sector within the European and International Action Division for the French Ministry of Ecological Transition. You are a member of the Interministerial Climate Team. Uh, you are on the Global ABC, Global Alliance for Building and Construction Steering Committee and uh, on the PEB Political Board as Deputy Delegate for, for France. Okay, so we can now start the, the discussion within the, this roundtable. And uh, 
well, the, the, the general topic, of course, The, 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 the general question I would like to ask is uh, how to decarbonize the construction sector concretely, massively and efficiently. So it's a very, very broad and complicated question, but maybe you can talk about your own experience and about your, your projects. So uh, first, uh, Christina, I give you the floor. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Um, I have the pleasure of leading a very unique organization, as you've heard, the World Green Building Council. Alliance HQE is one of our over 70 members from around the world, and we're saying we're quite unique because we are collaborating to decarbonize the built environment and drive forward sustainability. And we are a collaborator, we're a partner, World GBC. Of all of the people here in this panel, I consider ourselves to be partners. The question was quite broad, how to decarbonize? My first answer is <laughs> you have to collaborate and work with others. That's the first big answer that I'm going to give you. Um, because it, it is happening in every sector, our conversation is beyond our frontiers of impact. And so we need to be driving forward that conversation. And, um, and since this, this invitation is by Alliance HQE and uh, trying to find some common translation and language to a global problem that also has to be dealt with by a local industry, which is building and construction, I would like to briefly as uh, introduce, if you, if you like, the, the building life project in a few moments, or I could hand over to my panelists if you want to go on decarbonization, or maybe I give a little bit more of flavor so it's not that big. All right, I knew it. Let's see. So, building life is a project that is a multi year campaign by World GBC in Europe that is tackling the concept of whole life carbon in the built environment. It is led by our partners, the Green Building Councils, and these, in this case, from the Re European Regional Network, to bring together that collaboration, policymakers, businesses, to ensure that Europe's built environment delivers on the Fit by 55 package, right? See, because to deal with climate action, we have to think systems and whole life thinking, and the built environment has impacts throughout every stage of the light cycle, and it's massive. From the demand side of energy, it's possibly the biggest emitter or contributor to climate change from the demand side. So what, what does building life mean? We brought together 10 European GBCs to try to continue to push the goalpost. What happened after Paris, we started understanding that the built environment has a big role in operational emissions that the life cycle of how we use the spaces is impacting climate change if we're not, it's not electrified. But then again, pushing the goalposts on the frontier and bringing whole life carbon, we understand now that the environmental impact involves manufacturing, transportation, construction, the construction site, and of course the end of life what happens when the asset is no longer in use? Are we going to still allow to go to landfill? So that's usually called embodied emissions, that other part of the life cycle. So to get there, <laughs> to deal with all those concepts and to tackle these emissions and to address this, this aim of a carbon neutral Europe, we have to understand that we are exceeding our carbon budgets today. And we need that radical collaboration to shift that conversation. So um, we know that policymakers are essential, right? We see here in the trade show, great, the innovation, right? I, I went all through the red, I went around and I love the red because in the red spaces of the innovation zone, you see climate neutral, climate action, a little bit of this and that. But we know that these are the leaders, but there's many laggards. And so we need policymakers to push the goalpost and to understand and to make people see that, they, that we're serious about taking climate action in, in this space. 
So the 10 European GPCs came together to develop national and regional decarbonization roadmaps. How can we act if we don't have a shared vision? We can say carbon neutral this and that, but we need a vision and we need a shared vision. And so that's what we're doing. And the councils that are collaborating are Croatia, Finland, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Netherlands, Poland, Spain, and the UK. And in May this year, we launched the EU policy roadmap. Why? Because there's layers and lens of complexity of policymakers and leadership. But this new bold policy plan at the EU scale now has the realization that we need different policy routes to tackle decarbonization. It's not a formula. It's not one definition. And it's not one entity. This roadmap brought together 35 leading industry bodies. And so with that support, with an incredible amount of consensus building and credibility, we hope that those roadmaps continue to inspire policymakers to take action in the four recommended areas for better policies to drive this vision of Fit by 55 or the European Green Deal as it was initially, let's say, more understood. So the areas are building regulations, waste and circularity. Circularity is key to enabling decarbonization. Sustainable procurement, so what governments are buying, and sustainable finance. And so we hope we are riding the waves of the opportunity of the inspiration by national governments in the EU, but also at the EU level. We have over 150 campaign ambassadors. Marjolaine is one of them. And we're very proud to have you being an ambassador. Also, we have members of the European and national parliaments, business and civil society leaders. So, so as we speak, GBCs are meeting policymakers, advocating for that roadmap and sharing recommendations. But it's not any recommendation. It's ours. It's yours. It's a shared project. It's a shared recommendation. So. This proposal includes, and I'm wrapping up, whole life carbon reporting for the Energy Performance Directive as a recommendation. So it's about building life, it's about mainstreaming that whole life carbon concept. And of course, the action is not as quick as we like. The timelines are a little bit slow. There's resistance by stakeholders, but this collaboration is how to unlock opportunity and do away with that resistance. So. This is an invitation. I'm not defining what to do in the companyization. It's an invitation to you to join the conversation. And from your, wherever you stand in the policy, chain, policy action chain, it, let's make it happen. Today, I have with me here Adri Nodjan. She is our Director of Global Advocacy at World GBC. And if you want to become a Global uh, Building Life Ambassador, go to her. We can also do that for you. So thank you so much. It's time that policy is fit for purpose for tackling the climate emergency and to enabling much more of the leaders that we have around the red zone. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we will ask you questions afterwards, I think. Now it's time also to, to give the floor to, uh, to Marjolaine. And uh, the question I want to, to ask you is, uh, and in France, where are we exactly? And uh, also, you, you probably know that we have a new uh, environmental regulation, not thermal <laughs> regulation. And you could tell us more about uh, this, this uh, regulation and how the, the, well, all the stakeholders will, will tackle this, uh, this new uh, uh, issues uh, coming with the new regulation. Thank you, thank you for having me. And I'm very happy to be here alongside the world president of GBC. Uh, it's an honor. And uh, Anne with Regis Mea, who is also such a dedicated facilitator and ambassador of our subjects. Uh, so for the French perspective, uh, the global geopolitical situation, the war in Ukraine, uh, energy shortages, uh, the pressure of climate change, all of that is forcing us to change. Uh, we are facing profound structural cultural changes and i think we are all of us facing the same challenges at the same time and so it's very important that we work together and share ideas uh, on how to go forward and and faster on those subjects so that being said in france the building sector represents 43 percent of french annual energy consumption and it generates about 23 percent of french greenhouse uh, gas emissions 
In order to reduce uh, these rates, France regulates, encourages and raises awareness uh, among players in the sector. And the objective is to achieve a reference level of energy performance in the construction and renovation in buildings. New constructions rep uh, represent only 1% of buildings. So at that rate, by 2050, only 30% at best of the total building stock uh, will have been replaced and achieved the required standard. So it is important, of course, to address existing buildings as well. And therefore, a law passed in 2015, parallel to the Paris agreements, uh, stated that by 2050, all existing uh, buildings, whether public or private, uh, housings or offices, they should be renovated in order to consume no more than 80 kilowatt per square meter per year. And that's the target. And at the time, the target was to, to, to tackle 700,000 housings per year. But uh, in fact, we are a bit lagging behind. And so we are struggling. Uh, and now the question would be more to tackle a million uh, building renovations, deep building renovations per year. So it's a massive uh, engagement that we need. Uh, engaging people to renovate, however, is no longer a problem. Uh, sadly, or thankfully, I don't know, because of the energy crisis, everyone is now convinced that we really need to, to push this for us. This, subjects forward and there is an unprecedented uh, consensus and awareness that building renovation is key to a socially just transition and with all these factors combined we could say that the road to massification is really paved at last and that we can really move forward. In France, you, say, you said so. Uh, we are however facing at the same time a new challenge and that is also pushing the actors of the building sectors uh, around a bit and it is finding um, the manpower capable of turning climate objectives into real-life renovation sites um, although it's hard to evaluate how many workers will be needed really is it twice as many is it ten times as many um, it's safest to say we will really need to recruit massively and that's really one of the subjects we need to, to tackle as well we need people we need uh, to, to not only talk about it, but, but to handle it on, on the ground and on the field really every day. And that, for that, we need workers. And we need to push that idea that without people, we won't be making it. Beyond the building renovation uh, that represents such a great operational and management uh, challenge, the, the other environmental uh, revolution that the sector has undertaken in France is our latest building re re regulation, the RE 20, uh, 20, 2020. And that's really a, a game changer, as you said, Christina. Why is that a game changer? Because it sets the basis for an efficient evaluation of carbon emissions in all aspects of the building and creates a frame of transparency that will basically prevent greenwashing. And it will encourage investors to select uh, for each pro project a combination of materials and technical solutions with a new guideline. Uh, it won't just be about costs and services, it will also be about the best environmental value as well. And that's new, and because of that, it will in turn engage industries to create the environmental value uh, of each of their products. So it will also encourage new ways of designing buildings as well. So this environmental regulation gives us the right incentive, the right tools, and it pushes us to ask ourselves all the right questions and in the right order as well. The Alliance for High Quality Environment that I proudly represent today owns the greatest database for environmental products declaration in the world, and it's called INES. And that database is at the core of the RE2020 and of this new evaluation system. Without it, the system won't work. And we can go further on the environmental scheme. Uh, I will give you an example about renovation. This year, uh, the HQE GBC Alliance has delivered a study on how the new carbon-oriented regulation could be applied to renovations as well. And we are creating a carbon payback indicator to help us decide when it's more interesting to renovate than to deconstruct and rebuild, and when it's not. Uh, so the question is, what is the carbon balance point? At which point uh, do the benefits of the renovation offset the initial carbon investment? The study shows that if no attention is paid to this indicator, the carbon payback time can exceed 50 years uh, for a building renovation. 
So in a world where 1.5 degree is still the target, the kind of information is vital and should really become systematic in our everyday life and strategic decisions. With that kind of method, you ponder what to keep and what to take out of the buildings um, you need to renovate. It gives you a steady guideline uh, to prioritize operations and avoid superfluity. And finally, it questions the interactions that the building can have with its environment. Uh, is it possible to increase the occupation rate of the building? Uh, is it possible to share space? A car park, for example, a room that isn't used much? Uh, it helps measure the positive externalities that a renovation can have, such as the reduction of trouble, for example. Uh, it might and it should even encourage new low carbon lifestyles at a neighborhood scale. So this is an illustration of how the building sector is shifting. And we went from thermal regulations, as you said, towards environmental regulation. And the building renovation, uh, the building renovation will also go the same way soon, we believe. And now the idea is, as you said, to share these best practices, to still learn from one another and to, to push together and as various countries push forward our innovation so that they can be implemented faster and very efficiently. Thank you. And uh, finally, Regis, uh, can you tell us more about the, uh, the situation worldwide? Because uh, you represent the global ABC, and I know that you uh, publish a, a report on the situation in, uh, in the world. So uh, what can you tell us about the uh, decarbonization and maybe uh, give us some examples in, in, in certain countries? First, I want to say that uh, maybe you forgot to say that uh, the World Green Building Council uh, and the global ABC has been uh, um, highlighted by the G7 as a two important uh, organization to decarbonize the building sector, maybe more uh, for the private sector uh, link and more for the public sector link to global ABC. So I think the collaboration even uh, is uh, watched by uh, the G7, and that's very interesting. Even the G7, G20 uh, four years ago said that the global ABC as well was an important problem. So only to, to, before to answer your question, so the Global IBC uh, uh, is a forum, uh, why? Uh, on the decarbonization of the building sector and resilience. Uh, why? Because uh, the building sector uh, will double its uh, floor surface by 2060, around 2060. So what we do uh, here in France, in Europe, has meaning for the climate, if only we um, are able uh, to to be kind of an example or uh, to, to show to other country that it's possible uh, to start decarbonization because we, we took 40 years almost uh, to bring the new buildings at the level that fits more or less uh, to the, the climate targets. Uh, so the country, other countries have no time to that. So we need really to show in their context uh, how, what is possible and so on. So the idea is to bring all countries in this decarbonization pathway. So our first task, as you said, uh, an example in Europe, is to have a regional roadmaps that bring together countries, because I, I think that countries at the regional level share some um, uh, climatic context, but as well economical social context, that they can uh, work better together, and that can bring as well uh, visibility for investment uh, the, from, of the private sector. For, I mean, for industry to provide uh, service or to provide um, materials, equipment uh, that fit for that uh, transition. So, um, so we are not uh, we are moving uh, in the, the, the decarbonization. Um, so the question is, I can't talk about the, the report that will be disclosed <laughs> next month. So I have to talk about the last year uh, report. Uh, the last year report showed that we are on track. Thanks to the COVID. <laughs> really, that means the impact of the COVID bring us on track. That means we should have the impact of the COVID every year to be on track. That means so far it's not the case. So that means we need really to, to have a, a deeper <laughs> engagement first uh, of countries, uh, necessarily not at the same scale, because I don't, I don't think that many countries are ready uh, to have a life cycle uh, approach now, 
but they have to be in the way to, uh, to go. Uh, if, for instance, if they are able to divide by two in engineer building uh, their consumption, it will be very good. I say about engineer buildings because they have a lot of informal, really informal, uh, not some informal buildings. So that is maybe a more social issue. Uh, this is different. Uh, it's important. You, you have a UN Habitat that is uh, more or less dedicated for that task. Uh, but uh, the Global ABC focus more on engineer building. That means maybe not all building in the developing world, but the, uh, the way to, to transform the building markets. And maybe I, I want to, uh, to highlight that uh, in the building sector, uh, there is different type of markets, really. We can't talk about the building sector at, at, uh, at such. Uh, there is uh, the, the commercial high rise commercial building that are uh, worldwide, market, almost a worldwide market because their clients are worldwide. So that's a global market. And the consultants, engineers, enterprise are worldwide. But mainly, they are local. So that's the question, how to bring uh, this uh, decarbonization uh, movement uh, uh, in each country. And for that, uh, we, we have to decentralize. And so we have the help of the uh, network of the uh, GBC. Uh, we have the, the help of our network of industry. Because I think that industry um, can be very uh, driving force for this decarbonization. Um, but they need to have an unumbling framework. So the, the task of the Global ABC is to push to design a cooperation be, be, between uh, government uh, to join force and uh, to, to push or to, to invite um, government to set this enabling framework that first uh, based on, the, as you say, a radical collaboration with the private sector, uh, because otherwise, uh, as a, a, the, private, the construction is mainly a private investment, uh, we don't have the capacity as a government uh, to transform its sector without that uh, really uh, deep engagement. Um, the, uh, sorry, uh, to read that. Yes, uh, another uh, point is that uh, um, we, um, we, we want to have a, uh, a, an effort on the training and uh, well, training our center of excellence. So at the Clean Energy Ministerial uh, last month, we start maybe uh, the beginning of a network of a center of excellence that exists as well in, in France that give our professional and academics uh, to ease and to speed uh, the innovation, the, the, the new development to be an innovation and to be on the market. So that's very important for us. Um, and I want to say that uh, for us as well, we can't uh, bring countries uh, without a financial help. So we need to have assistance. So that's why uh, we are very pleased to have been able to sparkle uh, this uh, program for energy efficiency in buildings, which is a joint program by uh, Agence Française de Développement and uh, GEZ, the German cooperation, uh, that brings at the same time, not pilot project, because pilot project, most of the time, is a pilot project. They are standalone, very nice, it's a showcase, but doesn't transform anything. So the idea now is to say, okay, let's at the same time have an assistance program uh, for um, a building owner, a large building owner, and at the same time having an assistance program for training and to provide finance. For instance, in Tunisia, we, we start a, um, a common project that uh, will design the new technical guidelines for the uh, sanitary um, buildings that will be implemented in one project that will be as, as well followed for the next uh, investment. At the same time, it will be training from the staff, uh, engineer staff of the ministry, and um, uh, training for the professional as well. So the idea is to bring, really, uh, to have impact on the market. So that, that, that's uh, this, the definition that we want to do uh, under the PIB. That we have eight countries, uh, more six, seven no new countries will be uh, included thanks to uh, European uh, funding from the engineer. Uh, uh, south of Mediterranean countries. And now, maybe next week, uh, we have the financing for the Green Climate Fund for what we call a PIB cool. That means, uh, uh, as you understand, that it is be more uh, focused on the uh, country in a warm climate to, to be sure that as well, 
they have a comfort, uh, even if it's heat wave or in the future climate. So that's uh, our task, it's an important uh, task. So I don't, I, because of the example, maybe I will talk about later, so <laughs> that's uh, at four o'clock. So <laughs> that's why I don't want to develop. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Regis. Uh, before we ask questions, I just want to, to note your wording, thanks to COVID-19. Uh, don't forget, it was due to a partial collapse of the <laughs> economy and manufacturing activity in the world. So I, I wish we will find uh, all the means to decarbonize <laughs> our environment. Um, before we, we take some questions uh, from the web or uh, in, in the conference room, uh, just uh, uh, one question for for you, uh, Christina, um, uh, you, you, you surely uh, you know that uh, uh, now in our uh, new environmental regulation, the life cycle uh, analysis and the life cycle uh, approach is integrated and it's mandatory now. We have seen this morning that it was not the case uh, so far in Japan. So it's a very important approach, of course. and. Um, can you tell us more about the about the situation in Europe? Uh, is it already integrating in all the regulation? Is the situation the same, or do you see some discrepancies? <laughs> uh, or and, and the same is this message uh, about the LCA clearly heard by the European Commission? I think so, but okay. so. Um, I don't have the full details, but I think I can call on Audrey if you like, and she can give me a shout out. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm an expert at being humble. I don't have all the answers, and the complicated questions are, uh, no? And you, yeah, come, come, yeah, yeah as, as if you were, no, 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 it's okay. But yeah, but else, first, uh, framing it, yeah. life cycle analysis is critical. We cannot manage what we don't measure. And we're talking here carbon neutrality, whatever. We need data. And we say, and we hear, digitalization is going to help decarbonization. All right. So how are we serious about it? Well, we have to be serious about disclosing data. So the first step is the EU and, and uh, national governments telling the industry, you're, we're going to be serious about the data. And when we say we're serious, it's life cycle analysis because you cannot just disclose a little bit. So I'll let you know what I'm doing, but this little bit of my operation, no, 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 no. You tell me the whole life cycle. So that's the framing. And that will enable both regulation and incentives to happen, disclosure, benchmarking, and that the industry gets serious in design, in understanding the carbon budget that Marjolaine was talking about. How are you going to understand the budget if you don't own your own carbon footprint? How are you going to, improve if you don't know how to use BIM and all of that to improve your design or improve the retrofit. So it's it's a cornerstone yeah, <laughs> of the topic. And I think it, we, we would be naive to think that we're decarbonizing in if we're talking 20 years ago when we didn't have the tools we have today. There's tools, there's free access to them. And in regulation, there are the, the, the Nordic countries are quite advanced. And now I'm going to pause and hand it over for Audrey for the details for all of you that are yeah. curious of what's going on and who's who and who's doing it well and who's lagging. I think you, you basically said it in a nutshell. The Nordics are probably the ones that are the, the most advanced. So um, in Finland, in um, Denmark, in the Netherlands, there's a lot of um, movement on whole life carbon and life cycle um, reporting. I think um, obviously in France as well, we have the, the new regulation here, so we don't want to forget um, France. But what we're seeing as well is um, real leadership coming from the EU. So last year, the European Commission put forward the revision of the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. And within that, there is um, a requirement that whole life carbon reporting will come into the EPBD. So we're hoping that that ambition isn't watered down as that goes through discussions with council and the parliament, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And that leadership from Europe, um, you know, they 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 lend on, you know, the the front runner countries like France and and the Finlands and the Nordics. Um, but then that also encourages those countries who are waiting for a signal from Europe to take action. So I think we're going to see in the next couple of years a real momentum behind whole life carbon um, reporting and targets um, setting in Europe. But as Christina said. The real issue now is getting that data. So I'll hand it back to the actual panel. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Audrey. And mandating the data. So one the easy policy thing that could happen now, which is the conversation we're saying, what the easy policy ask is, I, I mentioned procurement, is just officially you're obliged to disclose your carbon data. Obliged. And then public officials can get serious on benchmarking by different types of assets and places and uses and everything. Just disclose the data and get sure and get serious on that. And then if you have proper local, city, national data, which is mandatory in the disclosure, then you can get serious in improving the regulation to improve performance and metrics. And that's, and that's, and that's a change of a mindset because there is also, we were, I was in the introduction, I was talking about collaboration. There has to be a change also in the collaboration from the utility sector. This could be done also if the utilities would be open to sharing with city officials, where's the intensity of energy throughout the city? How is it used? And that they are shifting their business models to be innovating, to <laughs> selling less energy because this also goes into changing other businesses. It's part of the just transition conversation. Be open to sell less, in di uh, diversify your portfolio, going to renewables, have the utilities diverse their own business and have a stake in going carbon neutral. It will facilitate the conversation on the metrics because at city planning level, that data exists. But when you go into a building stock and you, you don't have LCA and the connection, you lose, you lose the data. And then you have a city planning thing, the utilities know it. And then sometime along the way, people don't get a smart meter. They don't know their usage. They could care less because they don't have a built in. Now we do because they're giving us in Europe subsidies to use um, subsidies to pay for our energy bills with very inefficient stocks. So now we're caring and so, how are you going to bridge that? It has to be through dealing with this and life cycle analysis. More and more, we talk about the reuse of materials and the reuse of uh, building components, but we need also a kind of uh, identity card and, and, and some uh, data also for, for this. We, we have some data on new materials, but if you reuse parts of buildings or components, of course, we have nothing. So it's very important to take account of the uh, embodied carbon and embodied energy, not only on new materials, but also these uh, reuse uh, materials. So uh, thank you. Do we have questions? Yes. Hello, a question maybe for Alliance HQE. Um, I wanted to know a bit more about the, the carbon payback indicator. Uh, is it public? Is it deployed? Uh, to be honest, I find it a bit counterintuitive to uh, to to uh, deconstruct, rebuild versus uh, renovate from a whole life carbon point of view, but also from a resources and circularity point of view. So what's your opinion on that and what are the main outputs of these indicators? Okay, I'll have to, to check in there. I, I'm not that uh, sharp on the subject myself, but uh, card, like she said. Um, but uh, yeah, our, um, our data is something you, you can find. And also the question is uh, that we need to, to objectify actually uh, the things that seems obvious and so that we can actually have measured um, cases where, you, where we can say on, I don't know, 95% of the case, it makes sense to renovate rather than rebuild, but there, there are a few exceptions and it makes it credible to have those exceptions so that you can be sure that actually when you actually count everything that is <laughs> countable, uh, you add up to having real information and not only a general idea of if it's 95% of the case, it becomes 100 and you do no longer, you no longer um, think about it and we need to still keep thinking about it all the time because the data is getting um, more and more accurate and as the data becomes more and more accurate we we will maybe discover things that at some point um, well wasn't open for discussion yet so I think it's important to to keep measuring everything and be very uh, precise on what is and isn't virtuous actually 
maybe to be clear what we want to defend at the global ABC uh, level that's uh, first uh, we have to keep uh, like in France actually two uh, indicators I mean energy efficiency and carbon so we can't uh, uh, overwhelm uh, everything by carbon uh, indicator so and, and the yeah. Yeah, yeah, but the global ABC is born for in the COP21 for the climate issue, so we're focusing on climate. We don't forget others, but our priority is carbon in uh, the, the sustainable way. Yeah. Uh, to complete on that, is we still need to have all link indicators at once because we, we, we have, of course, to have a, a focus at some point on energy or on carbon so that we can uh, focus our minds on something and, and analyze it. But we must never lose sight of all other indicators. And you mentioned the question of circularity, but we could talk about water, we could co talk about the comfort of the inhabitants and their health. Uh, we could we could uh, talk about safety, uh, basically, that is also an issue and we mustn't uh, forget that, or the capacity for a building to be resilient in the future towards uh, uh, dramatic events that happens uh, because of climate change. Uh, these are all indicators that need to be taken into account as well, at the same time that we are focusing on reducing carbon and reducing energy. And it's, uh, but of course we have, <laughs> we need to be efficient to have a few focuses now and there to, to set our minds to having results on those, uh, on those special uh, aspects. Thank you. I guess my question goes for the three of you. I work in a, in a department which is in charge of providing some technical assistance to um, structural designers. So we perform LCA to compare different buildings uh, made with different variants. Um, and we, of course, push for a, a full life cycle anas analysis where we take into account the end of life. But the thing is that we work all over Europe and we notice that actually in different countries, different regulations are in place. Doesn't work anymore. Oh, yeah, it does. Um, in some countries, actually, they only focus on the production stages of the life cycle. In France, for example, there is this um, waiting factor on the end of life. So I fully share this fact that, OK, in Europe, we should adopt a shared vision. But concretely, today, it's not the case. And sometimes it's a bit frustrating because um, a logic that we apply in a given country would not be valid anymore in another country. So um, yeah, what, what is your feeling about that? And, and how do you think it will evolve? Will Europe ask some countries to change their um, principles and regulation to adopt something which is more uniform? Or do you think each country will keep its own uh, specificity? Uh, maybe uh, only to say that the first is a transparency uh, duty. So I think, uh, and uh, in Europe, I think that uh, everybody is based on the same norm. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, but uh, no, the calcul yes, but uh, after, based on the same norm, you have adaptation and, and you can, uh, on the button, a lot of providers are saying you can calculate without amortization and you can push a button, you can calculate with amortization. So in this case, you have the both. So. Yeah, but in, in terms of results, important. it will give you completely different things yeah, because if you perform end of life, uh, sorry, life cycle analysis. Yes, but if you don't wait, it's a, it's a political choice to say, are you certain of the recycling in 60 years? Are, are you certain of that? I, I'm not putting into no, question no, yes, but, what but is the question, I, I think you have to accept that some countries say, after consultation between professionals and so on, saying, okay, we have this vision that maybe to, you, you, the, the climate now has to be protected. Uh -huh. So when you have the end of life, you disvalue a little the benefit that you can have because you don't know how it will change. Regis, if you I may, I think, I think we're in agreement. She's, she's in agreement with you. The question is, and the reality is that, unfortunately, when it comes to different jurisdictions, the application of the ideas change. It even changes city by city, what exactly. I was saying on procurement. We're with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's glimmers of hope for some sort of standardization on how that happens. Is this life levels initiative from the EU, right, Audrey? So that, that is helpful to, uh, 
to, let's say, have a vision from the EU perspective on life cycle analysis and how every everything fits. However, unfortunately, this, the sector is nuanced locally. So the local vision also changes the priority of different jurisdictions and how they see it. But I hope that as we mainstream that it is the full picture, the whole life assay assessment that is valid, not one piece over the other, right? Sometimes they may be looking at end of life if they have problems with where do they put ways to landfill or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that that vision will enable you when you are proposing them improvements in their design or options to better value the full performance, not the little pieces. Yeah. But we're still not there yet because there's a disconnect in the industry of what it means to do integrative design, which is bringing all the different stakeholders early on to make the choices. It's really hard to change a vision when you're already starting to a project. A that's that's mm -hmm. the, 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 the more you're on the road of a project, the less successful you're going to be to make it sustainable or even carbon neutral. So I think part of the disclosure that I was saying, the idea of mandatory disclosure is early on in the phases so people can we can do better training of people making better choices and making them understand that they have to work with you early not late yeah. and if we work early maybe the full life cycle will be better but right now it's messy and some systems and some cities in the in the nordic countries for example oslo is doing amazing thought leadership and doing amazing things that have to trickle down so i think the collaboration is with these organizations and the city network, C40 is, a, is very active in this too, how to trickle that down and, and, and let others learn from what you want to achieve and others that are doing it right. So, it's, so we continue to promote who's doing it well without shaming the ones that are not doing it that well, okay. but trying them to get on the journey of seeing how that would they improve in, in what they want to achieve as regulators. Regulators want to do well. So leading by example. Yes, leading by example. Also, I would say um, the the question of standardization is in, interesting when you want to 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 have a broader impact and uh, and so on. But at the same time, all the various differences that we have, countries by countries, are also a, a way of pushing forward innovation and asking each other the right questions. And if you standardize too early on. Well, you can miss out on a few aspects that could be good questions asked and at some point, who knows uh, which way um, the innovation will lead us. And so the, I think we need to have room for our differences as well because they they fuel our reflection as well. And wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be a shame if we all spoke really the same language? I mean, for example, in Europe and in the world, we would lose so much if you had only one language in the world. It would be easier to communicate and stuff, but wouldn't we lose culture? And well, maybe that's a little bit the same way. If we have something that is totally standardized right at first, aren't we missing out on innovation? And I mean, original perspectives that can actually feed the whole to make it more ambitious and, and efficient. But do you confirm that it's, let's say, the, um, the will of the European Commission to push to consider end of life and end of full life cycle analysis instead of looking at just some chunks of the cycle? Yeah, okay, thanks. Is there another question? Last question, maybe, uh, from the web? No? No more? So I have one. <laughs> Uh, I have one question maybe for, for Christina and, and, and Marjolaine. Uh, first. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, uh, in the past, the, um, the, the, the Green Building Council uh, have been uh, instrumental in developing uh, rating tools and green building assessment systems. And if you remember, uh, maybe 20 years ago, these systems were uh, more descriptive. And then there was a big change when they became uh, performance oriented. We developed uh, key performance indicators and uh, also uh, at the European level, we have developed levels. And uh, my question is the following, uh, taking account, uh, account of all these issues we recently discussed, what uh, do you uh, think the um, 
how we should develop this, these systems. What is missing today? Uh, can you imagine how they can evolve in, in the in the future to, to take new issues into account? Uh, yeah, all right. Yes, as I said, I'm very lucky to represent an organization of over 70 green building councils and around, we've been around I, World GPC uh, for 20 years. In that journey, yes, there has been, let's say, tools developed in different jurisdictions and now they're, evol they're still evolving yeah. to being more performance-based and, of course, uh, continuing to as to megatrend. Pa the Paris Agreement, the Sustainable Development Goals have asked us much, to do much better. What we thought was good practice two years ago continues to evolve as the IPCC reports come out, and we know we need to have emissions by 2030 in this industry. So what I would say is expect more of that. I think rating tools right now are revisiting their holistic approach to sustainability. I guess that's, that's, a, that's one way to go about it. But also this movement is having substantial, let's say, collaboration with the sustainable finance industry. So I would say what, what others are also under, if we, it's really interesting because here we haven't figured out internally as an industry, some of the, of the glossary of the language, right? But as that happens, we still have to have conversations with other industries that are asking us, what are you doing and how can I discriminate a better quality infrastructure than one? What is it that isn't? So my, my, my question, my answer is, it's still gonna be evolving. It is evolving through conversations with the sustainable finance movement. And it is evolving, of course, as a, we do the roadmaps in building life and we have different roadmaps for countries and national roadmaps, the tools will continue to evolve to join that journey. And that will be, that will be kind of the same holistic goals around the world, but of course, with locally relevant issues, because the built environment can help us as humans deal with our with our issues, but also can enable us to have a better quality of life. And that goes through an evolution of the climate action agenda and an evolution of the climate of the sustainable finance community that is demanding from us a few more a key metrics for them to understand what are we about and what's a good asset from a bad asset mm -hmm. from a climate risk perspective. OK, thank you. Marjorie, you want to you add something? Oh. Well, it was really well said, so I'm not sure. I hope so, because it's been a long session. <laughs> Thank you for taking that one. <laughs> well, uh, maybe it makes me think of um, uh, the fact that we are now working on a label that is supposed to accompany the RE 2020 in France, and it's supposed to be multi-criteria, uh, whereas we used to have with the RE 2020 a big one major addition to uh, thermal regulation was the environmental one with the carbon uh, indicator uh, on top of it. We know that we still have to to improve on the um, um, the summer comforts. Uh, uh, that is an indicator that we need to be working on. And you mentioned it. It's uh, it's a question that is uh, discussed everywhere. And I agree with uh, with Christina to the fact that. Um, it's going to vary not only from country to country, but also from region to region, even within France. Uh, we should have a, a kind of shared grammar, but it would be, it should be okay that region by region, we should have some kind of uh, like bricks uh, that can be used at will by people from a certain area to answer what they need in their special specific area so in that region maybe it's more it has to do with the, the question of heat in the summer uh, there it might be something to do with being resilient to i don't know earthquakes and whatever and of course we should have all indicators um maybe available maybe in a, in a dreamland in like in 20 30 40 50 years we'll have these indicators worldwide and we can pick from those indicators with the same grammar the same measurements uh the same metrics uh, so that we can compare and really improve the solutions and we can still pick something that fits us specifically in a special region so that we can differentiate uh, what has at some point been a bit standardized to one fits all. Now maybe we can push something that is more specific and well, has to do with what we really want and really need. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. And, and maybe also more uh, human development indicators or human aspects. Okay. Thank you. It, it's time now to uh, continue the uh, the other uh, sessions. Thank you very much. And uh, Christina, you you stay on stage, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Take your time. Okay. Okay. So I, I need one minute. Yeah, 